Let's all stand. It's time for the children to be dismissed to go downstairs for our children's worship. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair when the same diverse shall gather over on the other shore and the roll is called up yonder I'll be there when the roll is called up yonder when the roll is called up yonder when the roll called up yonder when the roll is called up yonder I'll be there on the bright and cloudless morning when the dead in Christ shall rise glory of his resurrection share when his chosen ones shall gather to their home beyond the sky and the roll is called up yonder I'll be there when the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. Let us labor for the master from the dawn till setting sun. Let us talk of all his wondrous love and care. Then when all of life is over and our work on earth is done, the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, when the yonder I'll be there. Please be seated. Well, good morning. Glad that you are here this morning. Just a couple of announcements before we get into the lesson. Um, first of all, uh, there is a new class. There is a a flyer concerning that class laying around the building somewhere. You might pick that up if you're interested. Now it is specifically geared toward young professionals, young families, and, uh, but we don't check ID at the door. If you're interested in the topic, you're welcome to attend. Now, the thing was, uh, I talked about uh, in the flyer a story about uh, would Jesus have a tattoo? Uh, would he have piercings and all of that stuff? Well. After services, somebody came and showed me a passage in the Old Testament, of which I'm familiar, and it says, do not mark your body in any way, and that was fine. And then somebody else came and showed me one right after that that says, but God has a tattoo. As it says in, where is it, Jerry, Isaiah something, that he has his name, engra our name, engraved on his hand. So this shows you the dilemma that I'm in. The class is canceled. No, 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 no. It's not canceled. Uh, but that is just kind of a story. That's just to show we're, we're really talking about what would Jesus do in 2022? What, 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 what kind of life would he live? Where would he go? Where would he hang out? What, what would he do? So those, those are the kinds. Of, we're not really talking about tattoos. If that's you, what you're thinking the class is, you'll be sadly mistaken. But we will talk about it a little bit. Uh, secondly, there is an event coming up. I have a, uh, a little... We're going to pin this on the board out there and then a sign-up sheet. You know what a sign-up sheet is, right? Because one of your elders tells me you don't know how to sign up. <laughs> and I verified that. I went and looked at the, uh, the service we're having out at camp. Three of us are signed up. So that's less than a dozen hot dogs and hamburgers. If you want one, you better sign up. This is called Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. Anybody ever done that? Raise your hand. One. Two, three, okay. There's a few. Guess who's coming to dinner? You have a host, uh, and we can't do this if we don't have hosts. You have to sign up to host. You have to sign up to get, uh, be a guest. Uh, we need some hosts. We need some guests. 
you will, if you're a host, you're going to provide uh, the house or the location. You don't have to provide all the food. You can have people bring it. But here's the thing. You, you, you don't know who's coming to dinner until they get there. All right? So that's kind of, it's a great fun, great fellowship. You sign up. If you're the host, you don't know who's coming. If you're the guest, you don't know where you're going until right just ahead of time. And so uh, it's a great fellowship event. And uh, here's the thing. If there's somebody, you know, and this happens because it's, it's just humanity. If there's somebody you really, really, really don't like, that's who's going to, you know, be assigned to your house. Um, that's just kind of the way God works. Uh, actually, we just draw the names out of a hat. You may have your own family show up. You may have a best friend show up. You may have somebody you've never seen before show up. But that's the joy in the process. Well, I'm excited today that you have chosen to be here. And we wrap up our uh, three-lesson series on one minute after death. Now, I'm curious how many of you were... We're with us last week. Raise your hand. How many were here the week before? Raise your hand. Okay, we have quite a few. I'm, I'm watching the board over there. We were about 20 short, 25 short last week. Hope that uh, you were able to, to talk to somebody about uh, what you missed. What happens when you breathe your last breath? When your heart beats the last time? Now, that's what we're talking about. We've talked about judgment. We've talked about rewards. Today we want to talk about heaven and reward. We talked about punishment last week. I apologize for that. But some, some people have asked, why do we talk about this? I just want to be alive. I don't want to think about death. I don't want to think about what's going to happen afterwards. It's really important that we talk about eternity because the key for this message series is what you believe about eternity affects how you're going to live today. If you believe you're an accident, if you believe that you're a mistake, that evolution has, has, has caused you to come to be, then you're just going to live a very selfish life. But if you believe God has created you for purpose and a reason, then you're going to live a disciplined life. If you've been created by God for the glory of God, it will dramatically change how you live. So I want to talk about heaven this morning. It's much more enjoyable than last week. I came to the reality that no matter how hard I try, I will never succeed at this particular message. I mean, how can you describe heaven? I will fall short every single time. I will never get it right. So if today you come to me and say, Roddy, the sermon wasn't very good. Well, today I'm going to agree with you. Because I can't do it justice. You can't hit the mark on this one. I did the best I could, but it's impossible. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9 tells us that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love Him. That tells me we can't even begin to imagine it. Our imaginations just don't go that far. So I can't do it justice. But I want to let God's Word do a lot of the work today. I want to read to you a couple of portions of Scripture, if you don't mind. Would you please stand in honor of the reading of God's Word? We're going to begin with John chapter 14. If today you feel a little bit heavy... If today you feel a little bit anxious, you feel a burden, you feel concerned, and I pray that the Word of Jesus gives you faith, gives you hope in the middle of a very difficult season. This is what Jesus said. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. And if that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You may be seated. Thank you. Do not let your hearts be troubled. I'm going to prepare a place for you. Those are the words of John. 
He's exiled on the island of Patmos. He has a vision given to him by the Spirit of God, and the Spirit of God revealed to him things that were about to come, things that were about to take place. And this is what he would say a little bit later. I apologize if that's too small to read. It says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be their God. Now, what will our God be doing? Look at the next phrase. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. We've always heard it said, there will be no tears in heaven. In fact, we sing it, right? We just fail to recognize who's going to wipe them away. Can you begin to imagine the Almighty God, the Sovereign of the universe, standing before you with a tissue? <laughs> wiping away any tears that might be there? Well... That's what John saw in his vision. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who is seated on the throne said, I'm making everything new. Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Never forget, Jesus said, Don't let your heart be troubled. Don't worry about it. Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. Would you bow with me and let's pray. Father, we begin this lesson by coming to you and, and we just ask for your mercy. We ask for your forgiveness. We ask for your strength. Father, we ask that through the truth of your word and by the power of your spirit that you would help loosen our grip and lessen our love for this world, that we would anticipate the glory of heaven, the glory of what is to come, and live in such a way today that it impacts tomorrow. And we pray this in the name of Jesus and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. If you will do such a thing, would you high-five somebody and say, I plan on seeing you in heaven. Go ahead. <laughs> now, how do you do this? We can't give it justice. So the strategy is, I'm just going to kind of let you know what it is. In order to try to help you understand what heaven is, I, I, I'm going to give you what heaven is not. Okay? Because our imaginations just can't handle what heaven will be. But, but I think we have miscommunication or misperception of what heaven is. I believe a lot of people just don't understand. We're going to go to heaven and there we're going to be fat, bald baby angels. And we're floating on clouds and singing hymns and playing harps for all eternity. But only verses 1, 2, and 4 because everybody knows you don't sing verse 3. Uh, well... This congregation does. I've noticed that about you. You, you, you sing all the verses. Uh, when I was growing up, we, we never sang verse 3. It was verses 1, 2, and 4. I guess it was too much time consuming. I'm not sure why we did that. But there are misconceptions that we have, three in particular that I want to bring out. Number one, ever known anybody that thought heaven's just going to be boring? Yeah, I see some yeses and I see some noes. For the noes, we just never said it out loud. Because you're afraid you won't go if you say it out loud. I mean, after all, if you say heaven's going to be boring, then you might not get in. Well, a lot of people believe it's going to be boring. Why do so many people think that heaven will be boring? I think one of the reasons is because Satan is a big fat liar. And that's what he tries to convince us of. There was Michael, there was Gabriel, there was Lucifer. Lucifer was probably the, in charge. And, 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 and I do a study, a class on, on Satan where we go in depth and we'll bring this out. But he probably, before he was cast out of heaven, was the worship leader in heaven. 
And he was beautiful. He was glorious. He was grand. And he wanted the glory that God had. Five different times in the book of Isaiah, he said, I will be like God. So he's cast out of heaven. He and a third of the angels. Many theologians believe those are the demonic forces of today. And what does Lucifer or Satan, the prince of darkness, do today? Well, he lies. He tries to deceive. He tries to keep you out of heaven. And if he can convince you that heaven is boring, you're not all that excited to go. If you have the idea that you will sit there and sing for thousands and thousands and thousands of millennia, then you start to think, well, I don't really want to do that. I don't want the other either because I don't like it too hot. So I don't know what to do. I don't want to go either place. Can I just stay here? Well, no, that's not an option. Heaven is not going to be boring. So don't just live for today. Don't get the idea that this life is all that matters and heaven is boring so I don't want to go. I kind of believe that growing up. I mean, I read the scriptures and looked at the passages and it sounded like you're just going to sit there and sing for all eternity or, or you're going to sit there and play a harp on a cloud. Actually, that'd be kind of cool. But that's not what you're going to do either. At least, I don't think so. Waiting to get in the pearly gates where St. Peter's going to check your name off the list and then he's going to give you a robe. And I thought, well, I don't want to wear a robe. And he's going to give you a harp. I don't want to play a harp. And especially not for thousands of years, but I would like to sit on a cloud. So what are we going to do in heaven? Maybe that's like way far off from what you thought. But what are you going to do in heaven for all eternity? Satan wants you to think that heaven is boring. Actually, it's the very opposite of boredom. Heaven is the most beautiful place. Heaven is a reunion. I, I, I've just got to tell you, my, uh, my grandpa passed away when I was in college. And I remember driving that special trip home with tears in my eyes. And, and um, uh, I, I was actually asked to do my, my grandpa's funeral. Well, I was still in college, and he and I shared a birthday just a few days apart. So we always celebrated together. It was very close. And I got up and to stand there in front of the, the audience, and, and I don't think I got two words out. And emotion just overtook. And my dad probably had in mind that was going to happen, so he pulled some notes out of his pocket and put his arm around me and said, go sit down. And he finished the funeral. I can't tell you how the longing in my heart to watch as I enter heaven to see my grandpa one more time. Or my dad. Or, or others that I've lost. And there are certainly others that I love dearly. I, I, I long for the reunion. I know it's a debatable, debatable subject. I know some people think you're not going to know anybody in heaven. I, I kind of think you will. Well, for the sake of time, I'm just going to give you some highlights. Number one, I, I, I do think we're going to know one another and love and be loved in heaven that we will recognize and, and love will be a factor. You can go up to Peter and say, bro, what was it like to walk on water? You can, you can go up to David and say, when you slung that rocket, Goliath, was that... Was that um, uh, was, was, that, was there luck involved? Are you really that good? You know, you can, was it skill? Was it luck? You can ask questions, perhaps. I don't know what it will be like. I'm just guessing at this point. But for those of you that have lost loved ones, maybe, just maybe, a child, a spouse, a, a friend, maybe you'll see them again. And, and there will be no heartache, no rejection. All I know is heaven will not be boring. And that's an assumption that I will make that we'll know each other. But also heaven will be a place of unimaginable beauty. Just incredible beauty. If no eye has seen and no ear has heard and no mind has conceived what God has prepared for them, that would imply perhaps new colors, new sensations, 
new and glorified heaven. Think about the beauty of this world. Just, just imagine the most beautiful place you've ever seen. Go ahead. Imagine it. You, you've been somewhere in this life where you just thought it was the most beautiful thing. Now heaven is going to be a million times better than that. Incredible beauty. Think about how beautiful this world can be. So boring? I don't think so. Now imagine the absence of sin. The absence of sin and Satan and, and the destructive powers that they have and, and, and what they've done to this world. How it used to be perfect. Imagine perhaps a big old petting zoo where all the animals are tamed. The lion laying down with the lamb. No sin, no death. Think about beauty. Oh, I can't even begin to describe. And how about this one? A new and perfect body. Somebody should say amen. amen. I've seen your body. <laughs> You've seen mine. Grandpa got sick. His mind faded away. But if you see him again, he's well. He's whole. Your receding hairline. No, you'll have a full head of hair. Your body will be perfect and new in every way. So what will heaven be like? Oh, it's just anything but boring. It is the absence of everything bad and painful. It's the presence of everything good and holy and glorious. Based on uh, certain studies of heaven, it appears that we'll actually have the glory of, of spending time with our Savior in a way that we enjoy and love and not a curse. It will be a blessing. It will be as it was originally intended. Relationships will be as they were originally intended. Oh, if you love gardening, you're going to grow tomatoes that look like they're on steroids. If you like singing, there's going to be singing that you can't begin to imagine. We're going to use our gifts and our passions to serve Jesus without the intrusion of sin involved. So for all eternity, you rule and reign with the King of kings and the Lord of lords. It's the presence of everything good and holy and just and the absence of anything evil and painful. Now what will you not find in heaven? Well, you won't find death, you won't find pain, you won't find sickness, you will not find fear, you won't find any depression, no more sleepless nights, no more abuse, no more heartache, no more racism, no more injustice, no more going to the bathroom at 3 a.m. No more Mondays for the glory of God and all good things to come and all good people, men and women alike, say amen. amen. Because heaven is anything but boring. The second misconception. We think this world is our home. We get attached to the here and now. We get attached to things here. So many people wrongly believe this world is home. This is what matters. No, Paul told the Philippian believers in chapter 3 and verse 19, and he's talking about those that don't know Christ, those who are even enemies of Christ, and he said their mind is set on what? Earthly things. Their mind is set on earth. Where is our mind? Set on things above. What matters now, what I have, where I go, how I dress, what I wear, where, uh, where I live, there are people who think that matters, but they are earthly minded. Their mind is set on earthly things, but our citizenship is where? In heaven. This world is not our home. We sing that as well. We eagerly await a Savior from there. From where? Heaven. This world is not our home. Let's imagine it this way. I want you to picture an imaginary straight line, okay? It's right here in front of us at the front of the auditorium. It goes that way as far as you can imagine and that way as far as you can imagine. It's a timeline. 
It goes back as far in history as you can possibly imagine, and it never stops. God has always been, always has been, always will be. He is that line. As far as the eye can see. Now imagine the future. It's out, out that way. Imagine the future. Your life is over. Eternity lasts forever and ever and ever. Where are you on this line? Well, somewhere out there in the future, out there in heaven with Him. But while you're here on this earth, you can look at that line. And you can say, well, let's, let's look at the history of mankind. Adam, for example, is somewhere that way at the very beginning of time. And then God created Eve, and she joins him. And, he, and Adam sees Eve and says, whoa, man. And that's how she got her name. And fast forward, we have Jesus somewhere. Fast forward, you have the Gutenberg Press, and that uh, printed the Bibles, and that's somewhere on that line. And somewhere is the Reformation. Fast forward to our era, you have World War I, the Great Depression, you have 57 Chevy, somewhere on that line. You have the 69 Miracle Mets, somewhere on that line. I know there's Cardinals and Cubs fans here, so I'm going with the Mets. <laughs> Fast forward to, to right here today, and you are on that line. It's the history of mankind. Eternity past into eternity future, and you're somewhere on it. But the point that you're on it is a small little dot. Scripture says your life is a mist and it just fades away. Life is short. You're just here for a moment and you're gone. And here's the problem. And this is what matters. Here's what I'm working on. There, there are three little Greek words in the book of Philippians. And some people look at it and they say, Paul's worried because people are preaching Jesus Christ. And they're, they're doing it not for the right motivation. They're doing it out of envy or selfless ambition or for whatever reason they're preaching Christ but not the right reason. And they get all upset. And Paul says, what does it matter? What difference does it make as long as Christ is being preached? Why are we getting all riled up when it doesn't even matter? So what I'm trying to do over and over, I'm trying to say, hey, when something gets me upset, I have to ask, what does it matter? Will it matter a hundred years from now? If it does, it might be getting worth, worth getting upset about. If it doesn't, why are you getting upset? You're here for a small little point in time that's barely even visible on that line. What matters? You know, is that you live in such a way that you make a difference here on earth. What matters is how you loved. What matters is what you gave. What matters is what uh, you understand gives life. What does it matter? 2 Corinthians chapter 4. The Apostle Paul said, For the things that we see now, watch this, the things we see now will soon be gone. But the things we cannot see, they last forever. This world is not our home. We're just here for a small little point in time that's barely visible. So many misconceptions about heaven. Most people are going to heaven anyway. That's a misconception. Heaven is boring, that's one. No, it's not boring. It's the absence of evil and the presence of God. And some people say, well, this world is my home. I'm not concerned about eternity. No, that's misconception. You're only here for a short time. Heaven or hell is going to be your home for all eternity. The third misconception about heaven is, well, most people are going to heaven, aren't they? Doesn't matter what I do. Doesn't matter how I live. Most people are going. I mean, good people are going to heaven, right? I'm a good person. I haven't killed anybody. If I did, they deserved it. I'm not a drug dealer. I'm not a bad person. Heaven is the default destination, right? No. 
Actually, don't forget what Jesus said. You need to take it very seriously. Do you remember what He said? Broad is the road. Wide is the path that leads to destruction. Many people are on it, but narrow is the road and small is the gate that leads to life. And how many people find it? Few. The truth is, good people don't go to heaven when they die. Who goes to heaven? Forgiven people go to heaven when they die. Forgiven people. Forgiven by the grace of Jesus. I want you to feel the power of God's Word, to internalize it. I want it to impact you. If you wouldn't mind, would you stand again? I, I apologize. Only if you're able. If you're not able, you don't have to. But I'm, I'm inviting you to stand again. I want to read God's Word over and let it move you. Let it stir you. Let it create a sense of urgency in you. Here's what Scripture says. For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. We're not good people. How many of you have ever told a lie? Raise your hand. How many of you have stolen anything? Raise your hand. How many of you, and I could go on and on. There's no need to, right? I mean, let's just get personal for a moment. Verse 24. Yet God, in His grace, freely makes us right in His sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when He freed us from the penalty for our sins. Would you, would you repeat after me? Yet God, Yet God, notice, not our righteousness. It wasn't our right living or right doing. It was what? Yet God, in His Grace freely makes us right in His sight. How did He do it? Through Christ Jesus, when He freed us from the penalty of our sins. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. How are we made right with God? What's the next phrase? People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed His life, shedding His blood, yet God in His grace. This is a, a glimpse behind the scenes, if you will. We wanted to accomplish it. We, we would love to accomplish it, but we cannot. He did it. Amen. He did it. Absolutely 100%. He did it. Now, He asked me to obey, and I gladly obey. Whatever He asked. If He asked me to crawl on my hands and knees to China, that's what I would do, but He didn't ask that. So why did we get into this series? Number one, I wanted to relieve your fear. There are so many of us that have a fear of death. I used to be a hospice chaplain. And I sat at the bedside of people dying on a daily basis. And it, it just amazed me at how many people were so afraid to pass from this life to the next. And I can't tell you how comforting it is when you sit by the bedside of a Christian who says, I'm ready. I'm not afraid. I'm ready. My reward is coming. So the, number one, I wanted to relieve your fear. Number two, I wanted to increase urgency to help you recognize that what you do matters here. Today, those of you that are saying, I don't know. I, I, I'm not a follower yet. We would love for you to become a Christian this morning based on His grace and His mercy. We would love to sit down and study the Bible and introduce you to a Savior that loves you beyond belief. If you are a child of God already, and you're wondering, what, what will happen when I die? We'll sit down and talk with you as well. We'll pray with you as well. Would you come to the front? Either whether your desire is to be a Christian or your desire is to just get right with God or just to be reassured, come to the front as we stand and as we sing.